All right, so I'm not really hearing any questions, so I guess we'll just jump into where we left off on Tuesday. So we're talking about cyclohexane and how the chair is the more stable version of cyclohexane. Any chair has a carbon that's at the foot of the chair, we might call that the feet, and then another carbon that's the head of the chair, and then <clears throat> these carbons here are all basically in the same plane as one another that's one way to think about a chair <clears throat> so last time we talked about when you have a single substituent on a cyclohexane ring that single substituent could be in a equatorial position if the chair is rotated one way <clears throat> If I flip the feet up and flip the head down, so I'm not flipping it over like a pancake, I'm rotating these carbon-carbon single bonds, the feet will become the head. And the head will move down and become the feet. So <clears throat> doing that to a chair, it changes the structure of the backbone of the chair, right? The way that this chair looks and where the carbons of the cyclohexane ring are located is different from this one, right? They're kind of mirror images of one another, and that's the result of flipping uh, or rotating the carbon-carbon bonds to flip the feet up and the head down. Whenever you do that, any group that is in an equatorial position, equatorial, similar to the word equator, means like around the middle, so the equatorial groups are around the middle of the ring, pointing out mostly, and slightly up or slightly down. So this one's kind of pointing slightly down. The equatorial groups will become axial groups when you flip, right? So whatever this carbon is, it's the same carbon as this one, right? We move the head of the chair down, and when we move it down, the group attached there still continues to point down. So if I have a ring, where my group is shown uh, with a dash wedge, that means it's coming either straight down or down and slightly out at an angle. If it's a dash wedge, it's down one way or the other, either straight down or slightly down, depending on how the ring, uh, how the bonds in the ring are rotated and which flipped version of the chair you have. So if I have a die substituted ring with two groups, the first thing I have to look at if I'm given the bond line structure is which of the groups have solid wedges and which have, which have dash wedges because that determines whether the groups attached are going to be pointing up or down. Anything with a solid wedge is always up. Anything with a dash wedge is always down. And so when I draw my chair, I know these are on adjacent carbons, so I can pick a carbon. I know the corn has a solid wedge, so I want to show that coming up. I know the methyl group has a dashed wedge, so I want to show that coming down. Alternatively, if I had drawn it like this, I could have put the corn really on any one of these carbons. They're all equivalent before anything's attached. I could have put the chlorine here. But since it has a solid wedge, I have to have it coming up. On this carbon here, coming straight up, there's nothing. Every other carbon will have a, a group coming straight up, and every other carbon will have a group coming up at an angle. So I don't have a group coming straight up on every carbon. The, the carbons that have groups straight, coming straight up are the ones that are slightly elevated compared to the other three. And so this would have a hydrogen in those positions. If my chlorine, if I wanted to connect it to this carbon, it would be coming up at an angle. And that's what I see when I flip the ring. Right, so if I bring the head of the chair down, that chlorine is still pointing up, it still has a solid wedge, but now it's coming up at an angle instead of straight up. And the methyl group would be on the next carbon over. It would have a dash wedge, which is down. But the carbons that have a group pointing straight down from, axial groups, are these ones. 
and the methyl group is not on one of those. So it wouldn't be pointing straight down, it would be pointing down and out towards you a little bit in this case. So these two, um, these two versions of the ring, all three of these are the same molecule. They, all three of them involve a chlorine and a methyl group on adjacent carbons with one having a solid wedge and the other having a dash wedge. Dash wedge. So in each case, the chlorine that's shown is coming either straight up or up at and out at an angle. And the methyl that's shown, because it has a dash wedge, is pointing either down at an angle or straight down. So the first thing you want to do with these is to make sure you obey the solid and dashed wedges and you don't put a solid wedge group pointing down at all or a dash wedge group pointing up at all. And then you want to really get used to working with the handheld model. You'll be able to use it during exams. It's extremely useful to make a model of this so you can rotate it around because the model will help you uh, see the chair in three dimensions and verify the chair you're drawing actually looks like uh, the model itself. Well, what we notice here is because one had a solid wedge and the other had a dash wedge, there's no way to draw a structure where one group is coming up in an axial position and the other group is also uh, and the other group is in an equatorial position. That would require them both to be pointing up. So if I, if I had a slightly different molecule with the groups positioned in different directions spatially, where maybe they both had solid wedges, CH3 or ME both mean the same thing, one single carbon with three hydrogens. If they both had a solid wedge, then I would have them on adjacent carbons, one coming straight up and the other coming up at an angle. And so I would have one axial and one equatorial. And if I did the ring flip, this one would become axial, this one would become equatorial. So I'd still have one axial and one equatorial. There's, there'd be no way of getting around it with this particular molecule. So it really depends on when, whether the initial groups are shown with a solid wedge or a dash wedge. In the structure that was originally drawn on the slide, when one has a solid wedge and the other has a dash, if they're on adjacent carbons, they could both be axial or the head can flip down and the feet can flip up and they can both be equatorial. And in this case, there's a clear difference in stability. The equilibrium that would form as these bonds continue to rotate back and forth, forming the product and then the product reacting back, that equilibrium would be very product favored. Because we, as we talked about last time, a group in an equatorial position coming out from the ring avoids a lot of steric repulsion. In the axial position, When my group's in the axial position, it's getting crowded out by the other groups in the axial positions. So the electron clouds of these hydrogens in the methyl group get too close and cause repulsion. That makes it less stable. And the chlorine is a <clears throat> decently large atom. It's got three layers of electrons. Its electron cloud is going to, to a small degree, start to crowd out with the electron clouds of the hydrogens on top of the ring. So whether it's an axial pointing straight up or straight down, pretty much always going to be less stable than an equatorial group that's pointing out from the ring, avoiding some of that repulsion between the groups that are all kind of pointing in the same direction. So let's look at another example here. I've got my groups on carbons one and three, and they both have dashed wedges. So what does that mean? It means they're both pointing down. So when I draw my chair structure, I have to put these on carbons one and three, and I have to give them both dash wedges, which means they're both pointing down. In this position and in this position, there is nothing pointing straight down. Right? So on the three carbons here that I have highlighted in red, at the, kind of like the top of these junctions, the axial group would be pointing straight up, and the equatorial group would be coming down at an angle. And so if they both have dash wedge, I can put the methyl and the ethyl group both in down positions without having to put them in axial positions. And so that makes a really stable chair because they're pointing out and slightly down, but pointing out from the ring avoids a lot of steric repulsion and, and makes it relatively stable. If I do the chair flip, so when we say chair flip, we're not talking about flipping over like a pancake on its back. 
we're just talking about taking the feet of the chair and lifting this up and taking the head of the chair and lifting that down. Um, so for the day nine and for this day 10 content, I made some short videos ranging from like two to 10 minutes long with some models to hopefully show you this. If you're not seeing it in the video and what you're doing on the quiz questions is not correct or the feedback I'm giving you on those does not make sense, please, please, please bring your model kits into lab this week or next week uh, and we can try to uh, help explain this in person with the models. It's much easier to see with, when you have the models on hand. So when I bring the feet up, that becomes the head. So if I were to number these carbons around, just keep track of which is which, the fourth carbon here would move up, it would be here. The first carbon would be pushed down, it would be here. I still have the ethyl group on carbon one, I still have the methyl group on carbon three. I still have the ethyl and methyl groups pointing down from the thing, right? Neither, in neither of these structures, is, are they ever pointing straight up or even slightly up? And so that's important to maintain that because they both do have dashed wedges, which means they should both be pointing down. When the feet get pushed, uh, when the head of the chair here gets pushed down, becoming the feet, the ethyl group still pointing down. It will end up pointing straight down, and that is an axial position versus the initial equatorial position. And when the methyl group on carbon three. Uh, when the bonds rotate there, that will get pushed straight down into an axial position as well. So rotating the carbon-carbon bonds within the ring to flip the chair always changes an equatorial group to an axial or an axial to an equatorial. It does not change whether the groups are pointing up from the ring or down from the ring. That's a really important point. So <clears throat> when I have this situation, clearly the equilibrium is going to favor the react much more than the products because when the large bulky groups are put push, positioned out from the ring they cause a lot less repulsion uh, so this one is much more stable here uh, due to the groups being in equatorial positions avoiding a lot of the repulsion if i put them in axial positions in the drawing on paper the methyl group here and the ethyl group here they don't even look like they're that close but if you make a model of this you'll see there are hydrogens on those groupings of atoms start to come too close together and start to overlap a little bit. It causes a lot of repulsion. The more bulky, the more carbons, hydrogens there are, the more repulsion, the less likely it'll exist in an axial position because of that repulsion. So let's take a look at this one quickly. Another chair, we want to draw that out. So here I've got an ethyl and a chloro, but there are have one as a solid wedge and the other as a dash wedge. So if I number these, number these, I'll put the ethyl group on carbon one with a solid wedge. So for this carbon, there's two positions. There's an axial position and there's an equatorial. There's always two positions on every carbon. One that's pointing straight up or straight down and then one that's pointing down uh, or up at a slight angle. They can't both be pointing up or both down. So one is either straight up and the other is down at an angle or the other is straight down and up at an angle. And that goes all the way around the ring. Straight up, down at an angle, straight down, up at an angle. Straight up, down at an angle, straight down, up at an angle, etc. all the way around. So if I want my ethyl group with the solid wedge on carbon one, it has to be in the up position. It can't be in the down position. That would only be true if it had a dashed wedge. If the chlorine is on carbon three, so these other atoms would then be hydrogens. The chlorine is on carbon three with a dashed wedge. That means of the two possible positions on carbon three, it's gotta be the one in the down position. And so this and this and this, the rest of those would be hydrogen. So this puts my ethyl group in an axial position and my chloro group in an equatorial position. All right, on carbon three, the hydrogen is pointing straight up, the chlorine should be coming down at an angle. And that's more stable because it's mostly out from the ring instead of straight up or straight down block, uh, bumping into other groups on the ring. 
So then I want to do the chair flip to see which looks more stable. So I'm going to take the head of the feet and move that down. So it's going to be down here. And I'm going to take the feet of the chair and move that up. The head was carbon one, it got flipped down. So number the carbons keeping track of which one was which and not moving them around. Carbon one has an ethyl group in the up position. So now that this group is no longer the head of the chair, now it's at the bottom or the feet of the chair, the up position is now the equatorial position. The down position is the axial position. So that moves the ethyl group. It's still up. It still has a solid wedge. It's not straight up. Now it's up at an angle, but it's still up. I'm not moving it down because it still has a solid wedge. And that ethyl group now is relatively stable in the equatorial position. The chlorine on carbon three was down at an angle, and now it ends up being straight down. And this, and this flipped version of the chair on carbon three, the down group is axial, and the up group is equatorial. So no matter what I do here, I've got one axial group and one equatorial group. So the one that's more stable will depend on the bulkiness of those groups. Which group has a larger electron cloud to repel the other axial groups? I want to avoid the larger group in an axial position. So if I look at an ethyl group, an ethyl group is a CH2 bonded to a CH3. A, cl a chloro group is just a chlorine. So <clears throat> the ethyl group is more crowded, even though chlorine is a third energy level atom, another layer of electrons. Here I've got multiple hydrogens on multiple carbons, so that's then to take up more space. So I want the more stable version to avoid the ethyl group being in an axial position because as the larger group, it will start to bump into the other axial groups on the same side of the ring. And so that will be less stable and the equilibrium will favor the other side. Any questions about those? All right, so here was the first quiz question. I'm going to do the same analysis here. So I'm going to draw my chair, number the carbons, I'll number the carbons here. So carbon one has a tert butyl group sticking up. So the up position for that is an axial position. That's not very stable, especially to have such a bulky group, you'll almost pretty much never see a terpenoid group in an axial position because it's so sterically hindering, it creates so much repulsion between the electron clouds. On carbon two, I have a methyl group in the up position. On carbon two, the up position is an equatorial position. On carbon three, four, on carbon five, I've got another methyl group in the up position. On that carbon, the up position is an axial position. So you want to practice with this enough to the point where when you see the chair and you look at a certain carbon and you're looking for the up position and the down, you know which one's axial and which, which one's equatorial. Half the carbons have the up position axial, the other half have the up position equatorial. In this particular ring, it's carbon one, three, and five. Every other carbon, the up position is axial. Two, four, and six, the up position is equatorial. And then the opposite is true for the down position. 2, 4, and 6, the down position is axial. 1, 3, and 5, the down position uh, is equatorial. So there's one version. I want to compare that to the flipped version. So I'm going to flip the head down. I'm going to flip the feet up. The head comes down, now it's still carbon one. Carbon one has the tropical group still with the solid wedge. So I'm not gonna have it come down, I'm gonna have it come up in the equatorial position. On carbon two, there's a methyl group up. So the methyl group goes from equatorial to axial. And the methyl group on carbon five 
was axial. It's still up, but on carbon five here, the up position is coming mostly behind the ring. It looks like it's up. It's just up slightly. Mostly it's going back behind the ring. Uh, so that's an equatorial position. So every axial group became equatorial. Every equatorial group became axial. And what we see here is the most bulky group is now out away from the ring instead of up above the ring bumping into the other axial groups that are above the ring and so this one over here is way more stable and much lower in energy mainly because this group is so bulky so like 99.999999 something percent of the molecules would exist in this form very few would, would exist in the other form just want to point out some mistakes I saw on some of your quiz answers. If I'm flipping the ring, I'm not going to redraw the chair in the same way. Right? Notice this chair became like the mirror image of itself. I'm not going to draw the scaffolding of the chair in the same way and then just take the axial positions and make them equatorial. That's not correct. This is a different molecule. It's a stereoisomer of the original one. It's not the same molecule flipped or rotated. This one would be correct if the original structure had the groups with dashed wedges rather than solid wedges because the groups are all pointing either straight down or down at an angle from the carbons of the ring that they're attached to. So you really got to make sure that your chair actually matches the original structure and that requires you to pay attention to groups that have dash wedges or solid wedges. So hopefully that helps with that explanation. Um, <clears throat> when you're dealing with cyclohexane, there's one other main issue before we get into chapter 5 and that is the cis-trans isomerization uh, or cis-trans isomers. So cis means same, and trans means opposite. So if I have a ring and the both groups, are identical groups, are on the same side of the ring, that's cis. If identical groups are on the opposite side of the ring, that's trans. And we need these terms because otherwise the names of these two structures would be the same. I have two methyl groups on adjacent carbon, so it'll be 1, 2, dimethyl cyclohexane. If those two groups are not positioned in the same direction, it's still correct to show them on carbons 1 and 2, so it'd still be 1, 2, dimethyl cyclohexane. The difference is spatial difference. All right, so these are stereoisomers. We're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. The reason that they're different is because this carbon-carbon bond cannot fully rotate. It can rotate a little bit, and it will if the, if the chair flips, but it cannot fully rotate, right, because it's constrained by the ring. If I don't have a ring, maybe I just have, like, two carbons, and I've got two methyl groups, and they're on the same side, well, this sigma bond can freely rotate. If there's no ring constraining it, it can freely rotate, which would flip this methyl group down like a propeller, and give me the other version. So if the bond connecting two identical atoms can freely rotate all the way around, you can't do cis-trans isomers. This one is not trans, this one is not cis. The cis and trans terminology is only used for situations where the bond between the identical groups cannot rotate, so those groups are constrained to either being on the same side or being on opposite sides. And since those two molecules cannot interconvert, They cannot interconvert because the rotation can't occur. They're different. They're not the same structure. These two are equivalent structures. They're not different because they will be constantly interconverting due to the free rotation of the carbon bond. So make sure I understand it's the rotation that makes, or I should say lack of rotation that makes the possibility of cis-trans isomers. These are called stereoisomers. This term stereo refers to a spatial difference. Oops. Spatial difference. 
between the uh, between where the groups are pointing. So the the two groups are still connected to the same two atoms. It's just they're pointing in different different directions in space. So if I have two molecules where they have all the same groups, but they're pointing in different directions in space, and there's no way for me to freely rotate the molecules so that they will be pointing in the same direction in space, that's what makes them stereoisomers. So I can say they're stereoisomers if there's a spatial difference, and that's the only difference. There's only a spatial difference and no other difference between them. Um, and they cannot interconvert through through rotation. If I could get one to look like the other just by rotating a bond or flipping it over like a pancake, they wouldn't be isomers. They'd be identical. So if the only difference between them is where the groups are pointing in space, but they're still not superimposable or interconvertible through rotation, that's what makes them isomers, uh, stereoisomers. And they're clearly not constitutional isomers because constitutional isomers require a difference in connectivity. If my ring had methyl groups on different carbons, so if I had 1,2-dimethyl versus 1,3-dimethyl, those would be constitutional isomers. Constitutional isomers are different in which atoms are connected to which. But in these two structures, I got the same atoms connected to the same atoms. They're just connected pointing in a different direction in space. Uh, when it comes to cyclic systems, uh, <clears throat> we talked about naming bicyclic systems. There are a variety of molecules that occur naturally that have rings fused together. Uh, this is just a couple examples here, camphor and camphene, of uh, these particular structures. Uh, they're natural products, meaning they're produced in nature by plants or animals, in this case plants, uh, evergreens, and they have a very specific uh, odor or a fragrance. And there's, so a, there's a lot of small molecules. As long as those molecules can evaporate, uh, they can be used in perfumes and, and other types of fragrances, and, and so those molecules have relevance. Um, and it's their structure and the way the structure interacts with uh, the nose and, and produces a signal to the brain that causes them to have the odor that they have. Um, <clears throat> when we're looking at cyclohexane, cyclohexane is the basis for diamonds. So that chair structure fused to the next chair over. So that chair uh, <clears throat> bonded to this chair connected the atoms bond together that creates a diamond so I've got carbons at every one of these uh, connections or links um, each carbon has four bonds and so these chairs are all fused together and that gives the carbons a lot of stability right there's no torsional strain there's no angle strain it's just a nice uh, tetrahedral carbon uh, with four sigma bonds uh, that's optimally stable for carbon and that's why diamonds are so hard and difficult to scratch uh, because of the, the bonds being so strong and the atoms being spatially positioned in a way to maximize all of their attractions through covalent bonds. If I just fuse two chairs together there's really two different ways to do that. There's cis and there's trans. right? So this illustrates what we said the difference between cis and trans was. We said cis has two identical atoms on the same side of a ring. And so the identical atoms we're referring to here are these hydrogens. They're both pointing up. One is straight up and one is up at an angle. One looks like it's like in an axial position on this chair and one is in a toroidal position on that chair. That puts this methyl, well not a methyl, but the CH2 group of the second fused ring into an axial position. So the cis decalin is not as stable because this grouping of atoms here is going to start bumping into the other axial hydrogens and causing repulsion. The trans decalin is more stable for the fact that all of the carbon groups from one ring and all of the carbon groups on the other ring, they're all in equatorial positions. They're all kind of pointing out and slightly up or down and that avoids a lot of repulsion. I only have hydrogens in my axial positions and so their electron clock are small enough where they don't really crowd one another out very much and create very much repulsion. 
And so it's the trans decalin that's the basis for a diamond. That's the most stable way to arrange uh, carbon when it's only surrounded by other carbon atoms. Um, just to let you know as well, cyclic systems are the basis for uh, all of the different biologically important steroids. Steroid compounds typically have four fused rings, uh, three six-membered rings and one five-membered ring. And then depending on what groups are bonded there and whether or not there are double bonds, etc., and where the, the degree to which alcohol is um, <clears throat> oxidized or, or reduced, it gives me the different versions. There are obviously more steroids than just testosterone and, and estro, uh, estradiol, but um, they all differ a little bit in, in what groups are attached or the, the stereochemical arrangement of those groups or the spatial arrangement of those groups. Uh, but the cyclic systems there are common to steroids. Just a little general information there. All right, so that ends chapter four for us. I want to get into chapter five now and talk about what happens when groups are positioned differently in, in three-dimensional space on a structure. And so we know the three-dimensional spaci spacing of the groups the positioning in space can affect physical and chemical properties, right? So obviously, if I have something like this, where I've got two chlorines in it, like a trans position, versus let's try this over here, versus the two chlorines on the same side, those two structures are going to have different physical properties. When the chlorine's on the same side, the more electronegative chlorine is going to make that side negative and leave a positive on the other side. Here though the chlorines are pulling in opposite directions. So the average position of negative and positive is going to be right in the center of the molecule so this one is nonpolar. So the spatial positioning of the groups can affect the molecule's polarity which we know can affect the solubility, the boiling point, the melting point, the viscosity, variety of other properties we talked about a little bit this semester and also in general chemistry. So there's a lot of properties that are affected by spatial positioning of atoms um, <clears throat> in biochemistry or in biology three-dimensional positioning of atoms is extremely important and that's mainly because all of your important biological processes that occur involve molecules that are very specific spatially so either some kind of protein a structural protein or maybe an enzyme protein it's going to involve this big chain of atoms so I'm just going to draw a really scribbled cartoon version of it but it's going to be some long chain of atoms and in the, in your body or in whatever organism this protein exists in that chain is going to fold up into a very specific folded structure depending on the protein it might fold up some specific way this long chain and when it folds up it will position in space certain groups, maybe an alcohol group, maybe um, a carboxylate group. Those groups are connected to this long chain. They're like substituents or side groups. And when the chain folds up, they get positioned in a very specific way. In space, three-dimensionally, this is going to be occupying a certain spot, and this is going to be occupying a certain spot. And, and when, this, when this molecule serves its function biologically by producing some structure, or maybe it's an enzyme where some other small molecule has to come in here, maybe there's a nitrogen here and maybe a couple carbons or something like that, and the nitrogen is supposed to come in here and form a hydrogen bond with this partial positive on this hydrogen, and then maybe another ion dipole attraction between this oxygen and that hydrogen. I'm just making this stuff up. The point is that in order for this molecule to interact properly with this protein molecule in a biological system, the three-dimensional positioning of the atoms is critical because these molecules are going to form some type of attractions and the attractions will only work if the atoms line up in space properly. So, in, especially in biology, the three-dimensional positioning of atoms is extremely important, and that relates probably most to organic chemistry in the production of pharmaceutical. If you're going to make a molecule that's going to be a medicine, it has to have the atoms on the carbon structure positioned 
in three dimensions properly so it can go into the body and interact with these proteins and enzymes in the right three-dimensional way, lining up atoms uh, to form attractions or do reactions. And so this kind of little cartoon also demonstrates that. So here I've got a carbon and I've got these atoms attached to it. R could be you know, some chain of carbons or the rest of the molecule. So there's a hydrogen and NH3 with a formal positive. There's a CO2 minus with a formal negative. These boxes are meant to represent spaces or areas of charge. So this box might be a grouping of atoms that has a negative charge. This box might be represent a grouping of atoms that has a positive charge. And so an enzyme might have these boxes connected and, and spaced or these groupings of atoms with charges spaced, uh, uh, positioned in space in a very specific way, does uh, evolve to attract these groups three-dimensionally and bring them in a, in a specific way. So if the enzyme doesn't have groups positioned, it, it might have all the same groups, but if they're connected in a way where they're not positioned properly, then this molecule won't bind. It won't come in here and form the attractions it needs because the groups aren't lining up, right? The negative grouping of atoms here needs to attract this nitrogen. And this molecule here just isn't the right molecule. It doesn't have the nitrogen, the hydrogen, and this carboxylate group positioned in the same spatial arrangement as this molecule does. This molecule has the right spatial arrangement for all three groups to line up and form attractions. This molecule does not. So the spatial arrangement is critical especially for molecules that are going to be taken as pharmaceuticals because they have to line up properly. Their spatial arrangements have to line up to allow for the right attractions to form uh, inside uh, different enzymes. So we want to talk about how to identify when a molecule can have sp spatial specificity. Right? So this molecule has four different groups. And so because it's a tetrahedral, there's two different ways to put those groups around the carbon spatially. And in this particular instance, if you swap group two and three, you get a different spatial arrangement of those groups. So we have to identify when that's possible in molecules, and then some terminology around that, and some of the practical ways to identify <clears throat> when I have the right molecule um, with the right spatial arrangement um, and how to differentiate that from other molecules that don't have the same spatial arrangement. And so this becomes very visual and very spatial. And so I recommend that you check out uh, some of the videos that I made specifically for day 10 with models to help you with the spatial understanding of, of this in three dimensions. Very visual, very visual, difficult to explain in two dimensions, especially from a distance. So. Again, if you, if you want any of this stuff re-explained uh, in person, uh, please remind me in lab. We can grab some model kits and, and go through these topics. All right, so we know that if molecules are not identical to one another, but they have the same formula, then they are isomers. How do we know when they're not identical? They're not identical if they cannot freely interconvert and if they are not superimposable. Meaning there's no way I can take one molecule and line it up on top of the other and have all of the atoms line up properly with one another in space. So if they have the same formula but they're not superimposable they are by definition isomers and now <clears throat> there are two categories of isomers there are constitutional isomers where the difference between this pair of molecules is a difference in the way the atoms are connected right so clearly if i have and you all gave some good examples of these in your quizzes if i have one two three four five six carbons if i change how the carbons are connected by disconnecting maybe one of them and putting it somewhere else those are constitutional isomers. They have a different constitution because the atoms are connected differently. This carbon was connected to this one, and now it's connected to a different carbon, so they have different connections. Stereoisomers have the same connections, but they're different spatial arrangements.
so that would be a situation where if I have like a chain and I've got maybe a group here, in one molecule maybe the group's pointing out at me. In another molecule maybe the group's pointing away. So are these two molecules stereoisomers right here? It's actually a pretty tricky. You can't just look at the molecules and know. You have to test it out. To be stereoisomers, first of all we have to check to make sure they're not identical. Then we have to check to see if there's a spatial difference. It looks like there's a spatial difference here, like one's pointing out at me and the other's pointing away. They're clearly not positioned in the same spot in space. So at the moment there's a spatial difference. But if I can freely rotate one so that it looks like the other, then they're not really isomers. They're really the same structure, just rotational conformers or rotated differently. And that's actually the case with these two. Because if I were to, say, rotate this carbon-carbon bond here, right now this methyl group's coming out of the plane. If I rotate it around, these two methyl groups, like the propeller, will kind of spin, and one will move, if this one moves behind the plane, it will end up in this position. And at the same time, this one, which is in front of the plane, will move over here and end up in this position. That's really difficult to show without a model. So I encourage you to make a model of this structure and make both of these models and then rotate this bond and you'll be able to see relatively quickly that they're actually the same structure, just slightly rotated differently. So stereoisomers are not just rotated differently, they actually are different because if I have a pair of stereoisomers, there's no way to rotate one and make it look exactly like the other one. So now with these concepts in hand, we can uh, do another example of constitutional isomers. So what about this? Is this an example of a pair of constitutional isomers? Six carbons in a ring versus six carbons in a chain? Well, the most common mistake students make with constitutional isomers is that they, they look like they might have the same formula because they both have six carbons but these two don't have the same number of hydrogens. So when I make a ring, because it's connected all the way around, there's only two hydrogens on each carbon. So if I have six carbons, that's 12 hydrogens. When I have a chain, the end two carbons will have three hydrogens. And so if I put three hydrogens on both ends, and then two throughout here, I've got a different formula. So to be constitutional isomers, they have to be connected differently, but they still have to have the same formula. So how can I make these two into constitutional isomers? I'd have to get rid of two hydrogens, and that would require me to maybe take a hydrogen off, and take one off of here, and then maybe make a double bond. I could have made that double bond anywhere else in the chain. It would still be different from the original structure in the way the atoms are connected. Obviously, one has a ring, one doesn't, one has double bond, one has only single bonds. But since they have the same formula, they're constitutional isomers. So there's almost an unlimited number of ways you can imagine drawing two structures that have the same formula but have different connections. Um, <clears throat> if my isomers are only different spatially, as we said, those are not constitutional isomers, those are stereoisomers. Um, and as we said for this case, because the single bond cannot rotate freely, there's no way for this methyl group and the hydrogen to swap positions and look like this structure. So the only way to make the structure into the other one would be to disconnect both of these bonds, then swap the atoms and reconnect them. All right, so if I have to disconnect atoms and reconnect them, they're not the same structure. Even though they have the same formula, they are isomers because they're not interconvertible or superimposable. But, in this case, the difference is only a spatial difference. I don't have to disconnect this methyl group and put it on a different atom to make the other structure. I have to disconnect it and put it back on the same atom pointing in a different direction in space. So the di difference between them is a spatial difference, which means they're stereoisomers rather than constitutional isomers. And we said this one would be called cis-12-dimethylcyclohexane, and this would be 
trans 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane. And there's other ways to differentiate them, but ultimately if they have different name, if they have different, uh, if they're not identical because they're not superimposable or not interconvertible, they have to have different names. And so we'll, we'll talk more about how to uh, name compounds to indicate um, <coughs> the differences between them uh, if they're not identical. I can do cis trans isomers on a double bond as well. And when I ask the question on the quiz question about cis trans isomers, most of you use double bonds. It's good that you're looking through the section. When I have a double bond, just like a ring, it can't rotate, right? So if this carbon were bonded to another carbon here, and then back to the original carbon, the ring would constrain this so it couldn't rotate. So if I had both methyl groups on the same side, it would be different from having them on opposite sides. But as well, I don't need a ring to constrain a, uh, the rotation of a carbon-carbon bond. Uh, if it's a single bond, I need a ring. If it's a double bond, I don't need one because the double bond consists of a sigma bond with the orbitals over Sigma bond can rotate without ruining the overlap. The sigma bond can be maintained, and the molecular orbitals that result from that overlap can be maintained even if it rotates. But the pi bond is not so. The pi bond area of overlap will only remain if these hydrogens don't rotate. If I bring this hydrogen up out of the plane and bring this one back out of the plane, that would cause this p orbital that's currently in a certain plane to rotate 90 degrees. And if one p orbital rotates and the other does not, I lose the overlap. So I can't rotate a double bond unless I have a highly elevated temperature that can at least temporarily provide enough kinetic energy to break this overlap and break this pi bond temporarily. And then it could rotate and reform the pi bond. So because these structures cannot interconvert at room temperature, they are not identical and that's because the double bond and also triple bonds cannot freely rotate because the pi bonds would have to break and there's not enough energy at room temperature for that to happen. So I can buy cis, uh, the cis version of the structure or I could buy the trans version of the structure. I can keep that in a bottle and I don't have to worry about the molecule turning into the other one because they, uh, they don't have the ability to freely rotate. The only difference between them is a spatial difference. Again, if I wanted to convert this molecule on the left into the one on the right, I could disconnect this methyl group, disconnect the hydrogen, and swap them. I'm not moving the methyl group to a different carbon or changing how they're connected other than the direction and space that those groups are pointing. So these two, again, are also stereoisomers rather than constitutional isomers. So we could draw a pair of cis trans isomers uh, with double bonds, I can put any group here and any group here. Do they have to be identical? Well, let's see. Let's uh, just talk about that real quick. So let's say I did this. Uh, let's say I put a bromine here and an iodine here. If all four groups attached to the little bond are different, there's no cis-trans isomerization. There's no cis-trans. I have to have at least two groups that are identical. So if I do this, and I put the chlorines on opposite sides of the double bond versus having them on the same side, this is a cis version of this, and this is a trans version. These are, these are stereoisomers because they're only different spatially. One has identical groups on opposite sides of the double bond. The other has identical groups on the same side of the double bond. So not every molecule that has a double bond will have cis-trans isomers. It does require you to have identical groups on the double bond that can either be positioned opposite one another or on the same side of the double bond. If I had something like this, there'd be no way to make a cis-trans isomer of that. Because if one of my atoms has two identical groups on it, well, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm not gonna be able to make a stereoisomer. If I maybe swap the fluorine and the bromine so it looks different, 
Are those isomers? It may look to you that they are at first glance because the bromine in this structure is pointing in a different direction in space from the other one. But I can take this flat structure and flip it over like a pancake. And when I do, the fluorine will come over and it will be where the bromine is. And the bromine will come under and be where the fluorine is. The chlorines will also swap, but they'll, they're the same atom, so they'll still look the same. So these two molecules are actually identical. They're just one is just a pancake flipped over version of the other. They're not really different. So to make cis trans isomers, I need to have two structures that cannot interconvert or be superimposed upon each other. And so I need identical groups opposite or on the same side of the double bond uh, to make that happen. I could also do that with a ring. It doesn't have to be a, a six-membered ring. It could be a, any ring. If I have identical groups on the same side, that's cis. If I have identical groups on opposite sides, because one is pointing up and the other is pointing down, that's trans. All right, so let's practice that skill with some examples here. What's the relationship between these two structures? I don't want to use that, because that means resonance. Uh, in this first example, the difference between these is that they're identical. They're really not identical at the moment, but they're the same molecule because one is a ring-flipped version of the other, right? If I bring the head of the... Uh, the feet of this up and the head down, it'll look just like this other structure. So all I have to do is rotate some of these carbon-carbon single bonds for this molecule to turn into the other one. So because they're interconvertible at room temperature by rotating single bonds or sigma bonds, that means they're really the same structure. Now what about these two? What's the relationship between these two? Well, these two are stereoisomers. In the structure on the left, both the OH groups are pointing up, one straight up and one up at an angle. So this would be the same as drawing the molecule like this. They would both have solid wedges if they're both pointing up. This structure over here though, one is pointing up and the other is pointing down. So I still have OH groups on carbon one and two in both structures. So they're not a difference in the way they're connected. The difference is just in one molecule, both OH groups are pointing up, and then the other molecule, one OH group is pointing up off uh, above the ring, and the other OH group is pointing down below the ring. And so this is a cis trans. Uh, these are cis trans isomers, which is a type of stereoisomers. Oh, uh, in uh, example three here. These two are the same, they're identical. The difference is a rotation of a single bond. Actually, no, I take that back. Uh, I looked at that wrong in my mind for a second. Uh, these two are also cis-trans isomers. Um, in order for this molecule to look like the other one, I'd really have to rotate this double bond. There's a hydrogen here, there's a hydrogen here. On this structure, the hydrogens are on the same side. And the only way I can get the hydrogen to swap with this ethyl group would be to rotate that double bond so the ethyl group comes up and, and into this position and the hydrogen comes under into that position to give me the other molecule. So the only way to get from one molecule to the other would be rotating the double bond and since that can't happen freely, these two molecules are not interconvertible. They, the only difference between them is a spatial positioning of the ethyl group and the hydrogen on the same carbon so they are stereoisomers, and more specifically, because this one has two identical hydrogens on opposite sides, whereas this one has two identical hydrogens on the same sides, they are also trans and cis isomers. Uh, so these are also stereo isomers. Uh, number four, these two are constitutional isomers. If I look at the formula, each one has four carbons and eight hydrogens. So if they have the same formula, they clearly have different connections. One is a ring, one's not. They don't even have the same types of bonds. 
they're definitely not stereo isomers, right? There's much more of a difference between them beyond spatial difference. There's a difference in how the atoms are connected that makes them constitutional isomers. And then the last one, these two are the same. These two are identical, just flipped over. Right? So I don't have to break any bonds in the structure to make it look like the other one. All I have to do is take the bottom of the structure and flip it up over top of the, the other structure. So flipping it over like a pancake, I didn't really know how to show that in two dimensions. Uh, that will make the molecule look exactly like this one. And so since they're interconverting just by flipping it over, that means that they're really the same structure. So if you didn't see any of those, make a note of which one you were struggling with, and then we can look at some models together in lab, and I can explain that uh, in person in a way, hopefully that'll be more effective. All right. Uh, we talked about this already. I uh, talked about this, so I don't, as we said, I don't need all of the groups to be identical on both carbons. As long as there's one group on both carbons that's identical, if they're on opposite sides, it's trans. If those identical groups are on the same side, it's cis. In this structure, I've got two identical groups, an ethyl group here and an ethyl group here, and they're on opposite sides of the double bond, so that is a specific, uh, that would be specifically labeled as trans. So let's practice some of these. So these are either cis trans or neither. So in the first one here, cis trans or neither. Well, I've got a double bond, so I've got at least these two carbons unable to rotate because the p orbitals on them have to overlap side by side and that requires it not to rotate. So I'm looking for identical groups on these two carbons and I've got a methyl and I've got an ethyl. So those two are not identical, but you don't want to forget about the hydrogens. There's a hydrogen here, there's a hydrogen here. And so if I have two identical atoms or groups of atoms and they're on the same side of the double bond and I can't rotate to get them on opposite sides, it's isomer specifically. This one is also cis. We already said, we already talked about this one. Both OA groups are on the same side of the ring. They're both pointing up. So if I were to draw this ring and make it look flat, my two, ethyl, or my two OH groups would both have solid wedges. So they're both pointing it up off the same side of the ring. <clears throat> this one here, uh, I don't see any identical group, groups, but once I draw in the hydrogens, I see I've got two identical atoms on the opposite carbons of the double bond that are pointing in the opposite direction. And there's no way to interconvert this one into the cis version without rotating around that double bond. And so this uh, molecule one and molecule three are stereoisomers of one another, although I have the cis version and the trans version. And then similarly, molecule two and molecule four are cis trans isomers, stereoisomers as well, because they both have OH groups on positions one and two. The difference is here, they're both up. Here, one is up and one is down. So this structure here would have a bond line representation that would look like that. And if they're pointing in opposite directions from the ring, just like if they're pointing in opposite directions from a double bond, that makes it trans versus cis. And then this structure we said is neither. If any time I have two identical groups on the same carbon, it can never be cis or trans. Uh, because I can just flip that molecule over like a pancake and this side of the structure will always look the same. So by flipping it, this one replaces that one, and this one replaces that one, but it looks the same. If I flip it over, just not rotating the double bond, but just flipping the molecule over like a pancake, <clears throat> it would look like this. Um, so, you know, so obviously, I don't have identical groups on, on both carbons on the same side or on opposite sides, so I don't have a cis-trans situation going on for that structure. All right, so we're gonna dive a little bit more deeply into stereoisomers. And we're going to look at situations where we have chiral molecules. So a chiral molecule specifically means a molecule that is not superimposable or not identical to its mirror image. 
There's a couple different ways to test that, and we're going to talk about this in a lot of detail. So if that doesn't quite make sense to you yet, hopefully it will once we start to look at some examples. What does it mean to be not identical to a mirror image? Well, <clears throat> if you look in the mirror, are you identical to your mirror image? It might seem that way. You look in the mirror to make sure you look okay before you go out of the house. When you look in the mirror, your reflection basically looks like you. But if you look in the mirror, your mirror image is really not identical to you. If you look in the mirror and raise your right hand, which hand is your mirror image raising? They're raising their left hand. Everything is the opposite, right? If you wear a shirt that has a word on it, when you look in the mirror, all the letters are all messed up. They're all backwards. And that's because the mirror image is not the same as the original. So you and your mirror image are not the same, which means they are not superimposable, which means you are a chiral thing. You are a chiral object because you're not identical to your mirror image. Can you be superimposed upon your marriage? No. Just like your right and left hand are basically mirror images. Obviously, if you have a scar on one hand or something, they're not totally going to be... Uh, one is not going to be the, the exact reflection of the other. But in general, if you have a pair of gloves, you have one glove for your right hand and one glove for your left hand. Right? You're not going to put your right hand glove on your left hand. It's not going to match because your hands... While they look similar and are mirror images of one another, they're not identical. Your right hand fits nicely into your right hand glove and the left hand into the left hand glove, but you can't swap gloves. They don't match up, they don't fit. Right? And that's a great way to think about chiral molecules, as we were saying. A chiral molecule has things positioned in space in a very specific way, just like your fingers are positioned in space off your hand in a specific way. And when you put your hand in a glove, it's got to fit right. And when a molecule goes into an enzyme, it's got to fit right. It has to have the groups positioned in space in the right way for things to properly line up. So we want to be able to look at these molecules in three dimensions and identify when that's the case um, and when it's not. So there are lots of every, everyday objects that are chiral. Uh, the test is to look at whether or not the mirror image of the structure can be superimposed upon the original structure. Um, and that's uh, that's the the true test uh, to to see if two non-identical objects are are chiral or not. Um, and as I've been saying for a while, I highly recommend that you use models, especially during the exam, and especially before you get more experience, because it is really difficult to see these things three-dimensionally when they're just sitting on paper or on a screen. Um, it's a real challenge, and you shouldn't give yourself, uh, you shouldn't make it harder on yourself than it needs to be. When the the model kit can be annoying because you got to put the atoms together and you know, snap them together and snap them apart takes a little bit of time. But it's worth it especially in the beginning because it will really help you see three, uh, see things three-dimensionally. And when <clears throat> when we start working on lab four um, that's going to be, uh, that's going to involve analyzing some, some molecular models. So that will give you some experience with that. Okay. So, if you're trying to determine if a molecule is one of these molecules that's like handed, um, <clears throat> meaning that it's chiral, meaning that if it were in the body, it would have groups positioned in space in a very specific way, like hand has fingers positioned in a specific way to go into a certain glove, the molecule may be capable of going into a certain cavity within an enzyme structure and binding in a certain way, but only maybe if it has the atoms position in space in certain arrangement. And so what we're looking for when we're trying to decide if a molecule is a molecule of this type is for chiral centers or chirality for individual carbon atoms. So it's important to differentiate between overall molecule chirality an individual atom chirality. Okay, so right now we're just talking about the chirality of an atom. We did talk about the chirality of an overall molecule. Uh, if the whole molecule is not identical to its mirror image, it's also not. Uh, <coughs> uh, if, if the whole molecule is not identical to its mirror image, it will be chiral. 
but the way to find that the whole molecule is chiral is to first look at the individual carbon atoms that are there and see if the individual carbon atoms are chiral. So the way to find a, an individual chiral atom, uh, carbon atom is to look for, to see if the carbon has four unique groups of atoms attached to it. Right? So this carbon here has a hydrogen, it has a methyl, it has an ethyl, and it has an OH. And I also made a video of this description with a model so you can see uh, how that works. So if my carbon has four unique groups attached, it should be a chiral atom. And that means if I put a mirror here, oh geez, if I put a mirror here and this molecule looked in the mirror, the reflection within the mirror would not be identical to the original molecule. That tells me that the molecule is chiral. So what we can say here is any molecule that has an odd number of chiral centers will be chiral. If there are an even number of chiral centers, it may or may not be chiral. We'll talk more about that later. But if it's an odd number of chiral centers and one is an odd number, then the mirror image of that structure will not be superimposable or identical to the original structure. So what we're doing here is we're, we got this mirror, we're imagining this structure looking in the mirror. Right? So if you were looking in the mirror and you reach your hand out toward the mirror, your mirror image reaches out toward you. Right? So anything like this hydrogen pointing toward the mirror on the, the mirror image, that same atom is also going to be pointing toward the mirror. Anything pointing away, like the ethyl group, it's going to be pointing away in the mirror image. So when you draw the mirror image, draw things closer to the mirror, closer on the other side, and further away from the mirror, further away on the other side. And that will give you the mirror image. And then you can think, and so we have a visual of that right here. And then you can think, well, what, how <clears throat> are these structures identical or not? Once I draw the mirror image, some molecules are identical to their mirror image. Those are not chiral. They don't have this three-dimensional specificity. If they're not identical, then they are chiral. So how do I test that? Well, probably the best way to do is to make a model of both and then try to see if the models line up and all the atoms line up. In this case, they won't. So I can, I can try to rotate this around and get the blue to line up on the blue and the red to line up on the red. And I can even rotate this carbon around here. But when I do, the hydrogen that's currently now behind will actually come out and end up being uh, superimposed upon the chlorine or uh, whatever the green one is. So I can't, get, I can't get this molecule positioned on top of the other molecule and have all the identical atoms actually line up. And that tells me that they're not superimposable and that they are a pair of non-superimposable mirror images, <clears throat> uh, which means they're enantiomers which we'll, we'll see that term here in a minute. So, <clears throat> if the molecule has an odd number of chiral centers, it's a chiral molecule, and it's not identical or superimposable upon its mirror image. And so here are some other examples. So here I have a chiral center. How do I know? Well, it helps if I draw in a hydrogen. I can see at this carbon there are four unique groups. There's a methyl, there's an ethyl, there's a chlorine, and there's a hydrogen. I'm not just looking at the first atom out, right? If I look at this a little more closely, the first atom attached here and here is a carbon in both cases. But that doesn't mean they're identical groups because this carbon has three hydrogens, this carbon has two hydrogens, and another CH3. So the groups are different. I have to keep going. No matter how many atoms there are, I have to keep going until I find a difference. If I don't find a difference at all, every layer out, then they're not different. And I don't have a chiral center. But if there's any difference between these two groups, and I can show that all four groups are not, none of the four groups are identical to one another, then I know that this is a chiral center. And that if there's an odd number of chiral centers in the structure, which there is because there's only one, then that uh, is a chiral molecule. Same thing here. So any of these carbons that have two hydrogens can't be chiral because all four groups have to be different. 
And obviously any carbon that has three hydrogens can't be chiral because I've got three identical atoms on that carbon. All four groups have to be different for it to be a chiral carbon. So here's my only chiral carbon. There's an ethyl, there's a propyl, there's a hydrogen, and there's an OH. Four unique groups making that center a chiral center. Over here I've got a chiral center. There's a bromine, there's a hydrogen, there's a CH2, bonded to another CH2, bonded to another CH2. On this side, I've got a CH, bonded to a CH. So the presence of the double bond makes this grouping of atoms different from this. So I've got four unique things attached to this carbon, bromine, hydrogen, and two different groups here. And so that also makes that a chiral center. And this molecule has one chiral center, so it is a chiral overall molecule. All right, so let's identify the chiral centers here. How many chiral centers are there in this structure? There are zero. So you might look at this one and think that it's chiral because you have an OH and you have an H and you have a CH2 over here. Oh, this CH2 is the same as that one. So I go to the next layer out. Well, this one is the same as that one. So I go to the next layer away, I get the same thing. So when I go, when I have a ring, if I go around one way and I find I run into all the same atoms bonded in the exact same way as if I'd gone around the other way of the ring, that means uh, those two groups are identical. So I have a hydrogen and OH, and then the other two groups are the same as one another, so this is not a chiral center. In this structure there, here though, I have two chiral centers. This one is chiral, there's an OH, there's an H, now I'm going one layer of atoms at a time. Here I've got a CH2. Here I've got a CH with an OH. I've already found a difference. So this grouping of atoms is different from this, which is different from this, which is different from this. Four different groups of atoms on that carbon. That's a chiral carbon. If I look at the other chiral carbon, same thing. OH, there's a hydrogen, there's a CH2, and there's a CH with an OH. So four different atoms or groupings of atoms attached to this one, and four different atoms or groupings of atoms attached to this one, two chiral centers in that structure. If there are two chiral centers, it may or may not be chiral overall. And so we'll have to wait until uh, later to get into that de uh, determination. For now, we're just looking at chiral centers. How many chiral centers in this structure? This is not a chiral center. There's a CH3 group here, and there's a CH3 group there. If any two groups attached to the same carbon are identical, it's not a chiral center. This is a chiral center. I've got a hydrogen, the solid wedge. What do you got at me? I've got a CH3. I've got an isopropyl group. And then I've got a sec butyl group. These two groups might look similar because the first layer out, they had looked like the same thing. But the next layer out, I've got a CH3 over here. Here I've got a CH2CH3. They're not the same. So four different groups attached to this carbon makes that a chiral carbon. If I look at the next atom over, I see that that one is also chiral right here. I've got a CH3. I've got a hydrogen. I've got an ethyl. And then I've got this group of atoms. So four different groups on that carbon as well. That one also makes that one chiral. This structure over here, it also has two chiral centers, right here and right here. So if you take a look at that one in detail, you'll be able to see that for each of those two carbons, the, um, <coughs> the atoms attached or grouping of atoms are all unique. There's no instance for either of these carbons where Either of those carbons have two identical groups, and so they're both chiral. So here was the quiz question. Initially, many of you wanted to label four chiral centers here, 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 and here. Uh, but this center and this center are not chiral because they both have identical CH3 groups. All four groups have to be different for it to be chiral.
If any two groups are identical, it's not a chiral center. Here, though, I have a chiral center. So I've got a CH3, a hydrogen. I've got this grouping of atoms, which is not identical to this grouping of atoms. So I make the same argument for this carbon. So these two carbons are my chiral centers in that structure uh, because those two carbons each, when analyzed separately, has four different groups attached to it. Any questions about any of that? All right, so as we were saying, once you identify your molecule as having one or more chiral centers, then you want to look to see if it is chiral overall. And in the process of doing that, you will determine whether or not it has an enantiomer. So an enantiomer is the mirror image of a chiral structure. So if I have an odd number of chiral centers, which this molecule has, if I draw the mirror image of that, they will not be superimposable. Right? So if I have an odd number of chiral centers, then the molecule is only chiral. Next time we'll talk about what happens if there's an even number of chiral centers. But if I have an odd number, which one is an odd number, it's definitely a chiral molecule. A chiral molecule is one that is not identical, or in other words, not superimposable to its mirror image. So if I draw the mirror image of the structure, it will be different, and it will not be the same as this structure, and those two will be enantiomers. So enantiomers are always in pairs. A molecule can never have more than one enantiomer. There's only one mirror image of this structure. There's multiple ways maybe to draw it or to position it in space. There's only one molecule that will ever be the mirror image of a given structure. So any molecule that's chiral overall will have one enantiomer. And to draw that enantiomer, which is going to be very similar but different spatially, so one enantiomer might one enantiomer might bind to an enzyme and the other one might not because their groups will be positioned differently in space. Uh, to, and, and differently able to, to form intermolecular attractions with, with spatially specific molecules. So to draw the mirror image, anything that is close to the mirror on this side, I'm going to draw close to the mirror on the other side. I'm going to mimic this, coming away from the mirror. If this is coming out of the plane of the screen, if it looks in the mirror, its mirror image will also be coming out of the plane of the screen. So this, these two molecules are enantiomers. They're non-superimposable mirror images. If you don't see that, make a model of this, hold it in front of a mirror at your house, and draw the mirror image of the structure. It should look like this. And then make a model of both and show that there's no way to get everything to line up. If I lift this one off the page and pull it over here and try to line up the two chlorines, well, this ethyl group would be lining up over the methyl. It won't match. So if I flip the molecule over to line up the ethyl with the other methyl and the methyl with, uh, I'm sorry, to line up the ethyl with the other ethyl and this methyl would line up over on the methyl, well, if I flip it over, right now the chlorine's pointing out of the screen. If I flip it over, it'll be pointing behind. So if I flip this molecule over like a pancake, it will look like this which is also not superimposable on the original structure. I encourage you to do that with the model as well. Or watch the video I made. I'm pretty sure I made a video with this, with this molecule to help explain this. So there are really two ways to draw the mirror image. Imagine the mirror, draw the reflection of the original structure. That's one way. The other way is to draw the original structure exactly as it is but to change every solid wedge into a dashed wedge or every dashed wedge into a solid wedge. Either of those approaches should give you the mirror image of the original structure. So that's what we see here. Here's an example of that. 
This is Carvone. Um, it's a um, aromatic, well it's not aromatic, I should say it's a fragrant molecule that uh, um, is volatile and so it, it gives away a, a certain odor. <clears throat> These two molecules look almost exactly the same. The only difference is in this molecule this group is pointing away from you back into the plane indicated with the dashed wedge and the other molecule that same grouping of atoms is pointing out at you. The only difference is a spatial difference. There's one chiral center and if I make the wedge or dash coming off of the carbon for that chiral center, I'll create two non-identical molecules that cannot be superimposed upon one another where the only difference is a spatial difference. They are mirror images, so that means these are a pair of enantiomers. And they have different properties. They have different odors because their three-dimensional shapes cause them to go inside your nose and interact with the receptors in your nose differently because of the spatial positioning of the atoms that they're interacting with inside your nose. <clears throat> so the spatial difference can make a, a difference in the molecule's behavior in a biological system especially. So as we said, <clears throat> um, one way to take a molecule and draw its enantiomer, if it has an odd number of chiral centers, at every chiral center take any dash wedge and make it solid wedge or any solid wedge and make it dash wedge and you will have the enantiomer. So we could draw, we can use that to draw a pair of enantiomers. So if I draw a structure, maybe I want to draw something that has uh, three chiral centers. There's one. There's another chiral center. And here's another chiral center. And you didn't have to make three chiral centers. Most people in their quiz questions just put one chiral center. If you just put one chiral center, I could do that real quick. As long as the four things attached here are all different, maybe I'll just put a bromine. Oops. <clears throat> if I draw the mirror image of that, I'll have its enantiomer. So anything far away from the uh, mirror is going to be far away on the other side. Anything pointing behind is going to be pointing behind on the other side. So these two are mirror images, they are a pair of enantiomers. Alternatively, I could have taken the original structure and just redrawn it exactly as it was without trying to imagine what it would look like in a mirror. Except my uh, dashed wedges are going to become solid wedges. And my solid wedges are going to become dashed wedges. So this and this are a pair of enantiomers, and this and this are a pair of enantiomers. Which means these two are the same. Just flipped over versions of one another. So I can do the same thing here. If I have an odd number of chiral centers, this one has three. <clears throat> if I want to draw the enantiomer, I can imagine what this would look like in the mirror. Anything closer to the mirror is still going to be closer to the mirror. Pointing out at me, pointing out at me. This will be pointing behind, and this will be pointing behind. These two are a pair of enantiomers. Alternatively, instead of trying to imagine what it would look like in the mirror, if that's weird for you visually, just redraw the structure exactly as it is. Change all the dash wedges to solid wedges and all the solid wedges to dash wedges and these two structures will be identical one is just flipped over version of the other so this is the enantiomer of this it's also the enantiomer of this because these two are the same so there's a lot of different ways obviously you could have answered that as long as your two structures are mirror images and not superimposable then they are a pair of enantiomers uh, we talked about counting chiral centers, so this one is also relatively straightforward. If I want an odd number of chiral centers, this molecule right here fits the bill. Any structure could be a ring, just to give you a little sense of variety. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be a six-member ring, it could be any ring. Any structure that has three chiral centers or three sites where there are four different groups attached is going to be chiral. So I could put something here. 
put a methyl group there. Right now, how many chiral centers are there? Zero. This is not a chiral center because as I go around the ring this way, it's the same as going around the other way. I need all four things attached to be different. So if I put something here, now I've got two chiral centers because I have to analyze each one individually. This one has a methyl group, it has a hydrogen that's not shown, it has this way around the ring and it has the other way around the ring. And since these two ways around the ring are not identical, that's four unique groups. So each of these now is a chiral center. If I want three chiral centers, I could put another methyl group on there. What if I put it here? Well, now I, I only have two chiral centers. Why is that? I added another methyl group. Well, what I did was now I made this one here not chiral anymore. There's a methyl, there's a hydrogen, but then when I go one way around the ring versus the other, they're now identical again. So this middle one here is not chiral even though the other two are. So instead of putting that there, I need to put it somewhere else. So it does take some thought, but... <laughs> Try that again. Methyl group there, methyl group there. If I put the other methyl group here, now I've got three chiral centers. At each one of these carbons, where there's a methyl group, there are four unique groups, right? This one here, methyl, hydrogen. This way around the ring is not the same as this way because there's a difference between the left and right side. And I would do that analysis for every one of these centers and I would find each one is a is a chiral center. So there's, a, again, a lot of answers there. Uh, pretty much an infinite number of answers you could, you could draw that have three chiral centers. You have to just make sure that all three carbons actually are chiral and, and have four unique groups attached. So once we identify a chiral center, if we want to name the structure, <clears throat> we need to account for the spatial differences between the molecules because that's the only difference between these, right? If I were to name this, it's got a four carbon chain, so it would be butane. The only substituent is the chlorine, and it's on carbon two, so it would be two chlorobutane. Same thing here, though. I'd number my parent chain, give the substituent the lowest number possible, and that'd be a chlorine on carbon two. So if these are both two chlorobutane, I got a problem. If I'd say, hey, go get me a bottle of 2-chlorobutane, well, which one would you bring? Because they're not the same structure. They're different spatially. They're not superimposable. They're not identical. So I need a way to change the name to designate which one I'm referring to. And there's, <clears throat> and the way to do that is to use this con ingle print log system to designate each chiral center as either R or so it says here designate each molecule either R or S. Well, that's true if there's only one chiral center, but if a, if a molecule has multiple chiral centers, I need an R or S for each chiral center, and that's going to affect the name of the structure. So I don't have to add like a long change to the name. I just have to put the letter R in front of the name or the letter S in front of the name and that would designate which of these molecules we're talking about. So we have to learn the system to determine when I have a chiral center, how, uh, when to label it R versus when to label uh, it S. So let's talk about that. So here are the steps involved. First thing you need to do, if it's chiral, it will have four unique groups attached to that chiral center. And so we have to prioritize those groups and the priorities are based on atomic number or position on the periodic table, or number of protons in the nucleus. Once you uh, prioritize the four groups, then we'll go through the other steps. So it's much easier if we do this uh, looking at an example, and there's handheld models, much uh, uh, makes it much more clear as well. So check out the video I made uh, where I described this structure using handheld model. All right, so <clears throat> here's my molecule I'm interested in. I find that there's one chiral center, there's a chlorine, there's an oxygen with an ethyl group on it, 
there's a hydrogen that's not shown, and there's another ethyl group over here. Right? So just to point out, if this had ethyl groups on both sides, it would not be chiral. And if this group and this group are identical, it's not chiral. So the oxygen in here is really what makes this ethyl group because it's attached to an oxygen and there, I don't have the same thing on the other side. That's what makes me uh, see that I have four unique groups attached to this carbon. This carbon here is chiral and so I need to determine whether it's an R or S configuration. So the first step, <clears throat> prioritize the groups. So I look at their atomic numbers on the periodic table. Chlorine has got 17 protons, oxygen has 8, carbon has 6, and hydrogen has 1. If the very first atom attached is different in each of the four groups, then I, I know their priorities based on their atomic numbers. So chlorine has a higher atomic number than any of the other three atoms attached to that carbon, so chlorine is priority one. Oxygen has more protons than carbon or hydrogen, so it's priority two. The carbon is priority three. Hydrogen is always your lowest priority. There's no element with an atomic number less than one, so hydrogen will always be the lowest priority uh, atom on your structure. What about this structure? Well, here I've got a chlorine, I've got a hydrogen, I've got a carbon, and I've got a carbon. Well, carbons have the same atomic number. So if the atoms have the same atomic number because they're the same element, I have to go one more layer out and look at what's attached to those carbons. And if there's no difference, then I really don't have four unique groups and it's not even a chiral center. If it's chiral, there's got to be some distant, uh, difference at some point. Right, so here at this carbon, all three atoms are hydrogen. On this carbon, one of my atoms that connected is a carbon. And so that takes precedence or priority over the other hydrogen. And so here, my pri top priority would be chlorine because it has a higher atomic number than carbon. My second uh, priority would be this carbon because it's got a higher atomic number element attached to it than on the other side. This would be three, and then the hydrogen would be four. Right, so the first step is to prioritize the groups attached. The second step, there's two ways to do this. The traditional way is to then take the molecule in three-dimensional space and flip it or rotate it around until the fourth priority group is pointing away from you. You want to put the fourth priority group into a position where it has a dashed wedge if you're doing this in the traditional way. And I'll explain the second approach a little bit later and that's also in the video. So, in this particular case, to begin with, my fourth priority group had a solid wedge. It's pointing out at me from the screen. It's pointing at me. I want the fourth priority group to, group to be uh, the fourth priority group to be pointing away from me. So, what do I have to do? I have to take this molecule like a pancake and flip it over. So, how do I flip this? When I flip this over, the oxygen will flip over to the other side. So by flipping this like a pancake, and I may just start calling it pancaking it, if I pancake it, it will look like this. Now the hydrogen will be pointing away. Right, if it's pointing out at me and I flip it over like a pancake 180 degrees, it's going to be pointing away. So that's step two. That is a difficult step. It's not easy to deal with these strings in a two-dimensional screen and think about them three-dimensionally. That's where the handheld model is especially useful. It's easy to prioritize the groups on paper, but once you make a model of the structure and you know the hydrogen is the fourth priority group, you can actually move the structure in space until that hydrogen is pointing away from you. It's easier to do that than uh, doing it on paper. If the hydrogen had already been shown with the dashed wedge, and it's my fourth priority group, I don't have to do anything. Uh, so then the next step, oh, uh, I'm gonna go through the next step before we go to another example. So the next step is then to look at the prioritized groups, one, two, three. Once your fourth priority group, uh, fourth priority group is pointing away from you, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Find the one, two, and three priority groups, and then make a circle from one, oops, to two, to three. If that circle goes in a counterclockwise rotation like it does here, that 
shows me that the configuration of that carbon is S, an S configuration. It's either R or S. If I had had a situation where the top priority group, whatever it is, top priority, and second priority here and here, if the fourth priority group is pointing away, and I go from top to second to third in a clockwise fashion, that's R. So if you can <clears throat> remember that starting at the top of a clock, at 12 o'clock, and going around the clock clockwise means you're starting your motion to the right-hand side. A clockwise means R. That is true only when the fourth priority group is pointing away from you. If I'm looking at a clock and I start to my left, that's counterclockwise, that's S. If I start to my right, that's clockwise, R for right. Really, the S and R stand for some kind of, some German words that I can't pronounce that, uh, because those were the scientists who developed the system. So it's hard to remember the R and S, but if you can remember R is clockwise going toward the right, S is counterclockwise, uh, that will work for you. But again, it will only work if the fourth priority group is pointing away from you. If the fourth priority group is pointing out at you, it ends up being the opposite. So we'll look at some examples that involve that. <clears throat> so let's work on this molecule here. Here I've got one chiral center, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and a hydrogen that's not shown, but I know has a solid wedge because the nitrogen is shown with the dash wedge. So first thing I want to do, prioritize the groups. Oxygen has more protons than nitrogen, an atomic number of 8 versus 7 versus 6 versus 1. So I'm prioritizing based on the atomic numbers. So once I've got the groups prioritized, I want to get the fourth priority group pointing away from me. So if I put the fourth priority group pointing away from me, if it's currently pointing out at me, i got to flip the molecule over. So if I flip this one over, it looks something like this. Now the nitrogen, now the nitrogen will have a solid wedge. If it was pointing away and I flip the structure over, now it's pointing out at me. The whole point of that was to get the hydrogen into a dash wedge position. My atoms still have the same priority. I don't worry about the fourth priority group. Now that it's pointing away from me, I go from priority one to two to three, and if I find that it's clockwise, that's an R configuration. So this chiral center has an R configuration. What would happen if I didn't rotate it? Because rotating in a space, you're maybe, maybe you're thinking, well, why is he drawing it like that? I don't understand how you get from here to here. You don't have to do that step. But if you don't do that step, and the fourth priority group is pointing out at you, you have to remember that in that instance, the fourth priority group is pointing out at you with a solid wedge, then R is actually counter clockwise, and S is clockwise. So it becomes the opposite because you haven't put the structure over. So if the fourth priority group point out at me, and I go from one to two to three, I'm going at counterclockwise. Normally counterclockwise is S, but in this case it's R because I have the fourth priority group pointing out at me instead of pointing away. So either way, whether I flip the structure over and do clockwise as R, or whether I leave the fourth priority group pointing out at me and I do counterclockwise as R, I get the same configuration for that chiral center because it is indeed an R configuration at that chiral center. All right, so <clears throat> this is the last step, uh, the last couple steps that we already talked about. And again, this is only true if the fourth priority group has a wedge and is pointing away. If the fourth priority group has a solid wedge and is pointing out at you, then it's the opposite. So however you need to remember that, 
do your best to remember it. All right, so let's do these real quick. <clears throat> Chlorine has a higher priority than carbon. Carbon with another carbon has a higher priority than carbon with all hydrogens. In this case, the lower priority group, the hydrogens, are already pointing away. So I just go from one to two to three. It's clockwise, so this one is R. This structure over here we already did. We determined it was R. So let's look at this one. Here's my chiral center. I've got a hydrogen. I've got a carbon, carbon, nitrogen. Okay. So when I'm prioritizing the groups in this case, I'm not concerned with the oxygens right away. I want to go one layer of atoms at, at a time. The very first atom attached to this chiral center is a carbon. Here is a carbon. Here's a nitrogen. Nitrogen has a higher atomic number than carbon, so that's my top priority group. Nitrogen has a lower atomic number than oxygen, but the oxygens are not at play because the first layer of atoms, when I make the comparison, nitrogen beats out carbon. So then, for second priority, I've got carbon versus carbon. So this is where the oxygens are relevant. The oxygens attached to this carbon versus the hydrogens attached to this carbon, well, the oxygen has a higher atomic number than hydrogen, so this would be priority two, this would be priority three, and the hydrogen would be priority four. So if we use the method we just talked about, without having to flip this over, just going from element with top priority to the next second priority to the third priority, I get a counterclockwise rotation, which means that this is R, because the fourth priority group is pointing out at me. I would have to flip it over, and then I would get a counterclockwise rotation, and then I would get a clockwise rotation, which is R. So either way I look at this one, I end up with an R configuration at my chiral center, because I would either have a clockwise rotation once the fourth priority group is pointing away from me, or a counterclockwise rotation with the fourth priority group pointing out at me. Sometimes you get a tie. If there's a tie, like we just showed, you go to the next layer out. Right, so here I've got a chiral center. I'm trying to prioritize these two groups. At this point, they're both CH2s. And they both have one more carbon attached. So right now I can't find a difference. So I have to one more layer out. And when I compare that layer, then I do see a difference. This carbon has a carbon, a carbon, and a hydrogen attached to it. Carbon, carbon, hydrogen. This carbon has a carbon, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen. So the carbons are the same. But here's the tiebreaker. One of these hydrogens can't beat out one of the carbons, so I know this grouping takes a higher priority than this grouping. And so now I've got one, two, and three. I can go counterclockwise, one to two to three. That would normally be S, but that's only if the fourth priority group's pointing away, so that means this is an R configuration as well. Here's another example where I get a tie. Uh, actually, this is not a tie. I just want to make it clear that we're not. Uh, uh, so we're going one layer of atoms at a time. And the first tiebreaker we find makes, uh, makes the tiebreak. Uh, and so by what I mean by that, uh, which will be illustrated here, is at this particular chiral carbon, oxygen takes top priority over carbon. Hydrogen is the lowest priority. These two carbons are the same, so I have to go one more layer of atoms. This one has a couple hydrogens. This one has a couple carbons. I'm not worried about the carbon-hydrogen competition, though, because I have to look at the top priority on this side and compare it to the top priority on the other side, which is carbon, because these three are all carbon. If there's a difference, I don't even worry about the rest. So the first atom compared to the first atom, if there's a difference there, the one with the higher atomic number takes a uh, priority. So in this case, priority one, two, and three, I would go one to two to three. That would be counterclockwise, but with the fourth priority group pointing out at me, counterclockwise is R rather than S. When you deal with a double bond, it counts as two bonds to the same atom, right? So here I've got a chiral center. 
I'm trying to prioritize things here. We've got carbon, 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 carbon. So first layer out, I can't find any difference. Got to go to the next layer. Here I've got all hydrogen. Here I've got hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon. Here I've got hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon. Here, well, how do I treat this? It's got a double bond. I treat it as if it's bonded to two oxygens because it's bonded to an oxygen twice. So this is like bonded to an oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen. So it, in this case, as soon as it's bonded to one oxygen, that takes precedent over any of the carbons and hydrogens. So this one would be priority one. Then I would be over here trying to determine which is priority two. These two are the same. So I go to the next layer, hydrogen, hydrogen, carbon. Over here, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. So this extra carbon is what makes a difference. That makes this priority two and the methyl group is four because it doesn't have anything other than hydrogens attached there. And so then at, once the fourth priority group is determined, I go from one to two, three. If the fourth priority group is pointing out at me, a clockwise actually means S. So that would be an S configuration. If we look at this structure here, I've got one chiral center. Here the hydrogen's already pointing away. But I've got to prioritize these groups. So cl the chlorine takes priority. It's got a higher atomic number than carbon. I've got two carbons. This carbon is bonded to a carbon and another carbon. This bond is to a carbon and another carbon. So here's where this idea is relevant. This carbon we have to treat as if it's bonded to one carbon here and then a carbon here and then to another carbon. Each bond is like another carbon. Over here, it's bonded to a carbon, carbon, hydrogen. So what this carbon is, a, is effectively bonded to just two carbons, but we treat it if, as if it's bonded to this carbon once, and then this carbon, and then that carbon again, because of the double bond. Over here, this carbon is bonded to a carbon, a carbon, and a hydrogen. So this one takes priority, and so I prioritize that one number two, and number three, and as we go from one to two to three, going clockwise, that's going to be R if the fourth priority group is pointing away. So hopefully you're seeing this. It's probably going to take a lot of practice. The more practice you get with the handheld model, the easier it will be for you to see these things on paper without the model. So I encourage you to get that practice in early and make your life easier in the long run. Well, there's a couple of tricks you can use, which we already talked about one of them. <clears throat> one of those tricks is if you can re recognize that swapping two groups will create the enantiomer, that means swapping two groups will change the configuration. It will make the opposite configuration. So another trick you can do to get the fourth priority group in the back, if it starts out in the front, is to just swap two groups. If you swap them, you'll get the opposite configuration. So in this case, going from one to two to three gives me an S configuration when the fourth priority groups in the behind or in the back uh, counterclockwise is S. So I know the original structure must have been R because what I did was to swap two groups and that always gives me the opposite configuration. So that's another kind of trick that you can use. I don't really use that one very much. I think what we already talked about uh, works well. Um, <clears throat> I can also swap two groups and that will get me back to the original structure. Right? So what happens if you're in a situation where the fourth priority groups, it's not pointing out at you because it's not in the solid wedge position and it's not pointing away because it's not in the dash wedge position. What if it's in a regular line position? Well, if I swap these two groups, three and four, I'll have this structure. So if this one was R, this one must be S. If this one was S, this one must be R. So I got the fourth priority group in the back. And, but if, if, if then I swap two more groups, I'll actually get back to the original structure. Swapping a pair gives me the opposite configuration, but then swapping another pair, whichever pair, it doesn't matter which, gets me back to the original configuration. So instead of having to analyze this molecule, I can create an identical molecule to it and analyze that one maybe more easily because now the fourth priority group is in the back and when I go from one to two to three I find that's a clockwise rotation 
So that must be R, which means the original one must have also been R. And this one would have been S, because swapping two groups gives you the opposite configuration. Swapping any two groups after that gives you back the original configuration. There's only two configurations. Uh, so summarizing the steps, <clears throat> so look, uh, take a look at this uh, quick example here. Uh, oh, this isn't really an example. We're just showing how um, the RRS configuration that you find when you do this analysis is added to the name in parentheses with a hyphen before the rest of the name. So we haven't talked about how to add alcohols. It changes the suffix to an OL. Uh, so don't worry about that for now. We'll talk more about that later. But just to point out how the configuration is added to the beginning of the name. So here I've got a molecule with two chiral centers. We haven't done anything like that. So let's take a look at this one. If you've got two chiral centers, you have to analyze them individually. So I'll redraw the structure here so we can analyze this chiral center first. Let's look at this one here. The oxygen takes priority. This carbon versus this carbon. Well, clearly this one has hydrogens. This one has carbon, so it's going to be higher priority than this one. And I've got a hydrogen pointing away. It's my lowest priority. So when the lowest priority is already in the back, I can just go one, two, three, clockwise. That means this is an R configuration. And that's the second carbon in on the chain. So it's the 2R I add to the beginning of the name because it's the second carbon that has an R configuration. If I want to look at the configuration, of the oops, uh, of the third carbon I have to look at what's attached there so on the third carbon there's a hydrogen coming out at me there's a carbon a carbon and a carbon so I've got to prioritize these carbons this carbon has an oxygen attached which is a higher atomic number than anything the other carbons have attached so that's priority one this carbon's got hydrogen, hydrogen, and carbon. This carbon has hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. So the carbon there takes priority over one of the hydrogens here and makes this two and then three. So here if I go from one to two to three, that's clockwise, which would normally be R, but when the fourth priority group is pointing out at me, I have to do the opposite, so that makes this S. So carbon three is an S configuration. So if I have two chiral centers, the way that affects the name is I put the chirality in the front of the name I have to put the number to tell which carbon is R and which carbon is S um, in, the, in the name of the structure. And that one's also uh, explained in more detail with a handheld model in, in the video. <clears throat> so here is the uh, <clears throat> last quiz question of the day. In this structure, I've got two chiral centers. I need to look at each one individually. So let's take a look at this one first. I've got a hydrogen pointing behind the screen and because the methyl group's occupying the space in front of the screen and I gotta prioritize the groups. I got carbon, carbon, carbon. Can't tell the difference, gotta go to the next layer out. This carbon's bonded to a carbon, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen. This one's got three hydrogens, and this one's got a carbon, a carbon, and a hydrogen. So the more carbons, the higher the atomic numbers. So this one has priority one. Priority two, priority three, and the hydrogen's priority four. When the fourth priority group's pointing away, I go from one to two to three. I have a counterclockwise rotation, so that one is S. Questions about that? Looking at the other carbon. Analyzing it separately, this chiral center here. Here, there's a hydrogen pointing out at me. Because there's a methyl group pointing behind. So again, i got to prioritize. This carbon only has one hydrogen and two carbons attached. This carbon has two hydrogens and one carbon, and this one has three hydrogens. So again, hydrogen versus carbon, the, the atomic number difference makes the priority difference. So more carbons. This stuff over here is not even relevant. It doesn't even affect the RS configuration because I already found a difference at the inner layers. I don't go, I don't worry about the total number of carbons in the group or how much branching there is. I only look one layer at a time until I find a difference. 
So here I've got two carbons and a hydrogen. That takes precedent, precedence over one carbon and two hydrogens, which is a higher priority than three hydrogens. And so here if I go from one to two to three, I have a clockwise rotation, but when the fourth priority group is pointing out at me, I have a, an S configuration. So those would both be S. Any questions about that? All right, so this is definitely something you'll want to practice a lot. Starting next Tuesday, we'll be having exams on this. So if you want to talk to me in the meantime, feel free to set up a time to meet. Uh, these questions, especially at the beginning of chapter five, will really be helpful with the stuff that we just talked about. So do those and check your work versus the solutions guide. If you're using the solutions guide to help you get to the correct answers, that's great. Eventually though, you want to practice enough to the point where you're getting them correct to begin with and the solutions guide is just confirming that. And if you, if you never get to that point, then you'll probably continue to make mistakes on the exam. So uh, that you know, may take more or less practice for you individually, but uh, please let me know if I can help you with that or clarify, or if you want more, exam more advanced examples to work through that are not in the textbook, um, I can you know, just draw out some structures and ask you to analyze them and then <clears throat> check them over for you. So uh, just let me know if you need help with anything. Next week on Tuesday, <coughs> We're going to be into day 11, and we're going to be finishing up chapter 5 and getting into chapter 6 a little bit. So the majority of that is going to be more stuff related to chiral molecules and spatial positioning of groups. And so I'm going to try to look through that um, over the weekend, and if there's anything that I think would be especially helpful to have a model for, I'll make some quick videos and put those up so if you want to look at those before lecture on Tuesday or after whichever you think would be more helpful for you I encourage you to do that any questions about anything from today I have a question about the last quiz question we just went over yes I got an R for the second one you just did for my um, chiral center yeah I um as I was talking about it just now I seem to recall looking at some people's answers and marking them as correct, even though something got a R and an S. I'm wondering if the question that I put into the master quiz document may have been different from that one. Is it is are the uh, wedges and dashes the same in those questions? Let's see which. Uh, Let's take a look at it. Is it okay if I show this, Kristen? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, there's a difference there. That's weird. <clears throat> so, uh, this structure is not the same one as on the quiz. Something must have happened there when it transferred over to the Google document. I can't imagine how that would have happened. So, the analysis that you did was correct. It's just a different structure. Okay. So, if you have this structure, on the actual quiz question. I don't know how it got different there at some point. Uh, 
this particular carbon has the opposite configuration than this one because the solid versus the dash wedge makes the opposite configuration. So in this particular, uh, for this carbon in the actual question that was in the Google document, which I'm not sure why this one was different, apologize for that. Um, looking at the priorities, I'd still prioritize them the same way. But here, the hydrogen's pointing away. So when I go from one, two, three, in a clockwise rotation, that action R versus the uh, S that we would have gotten there. So this one was S, and this one was S. Okay, thank you. That just threw me off for a second because I wasn't sure. Yeah, it was throwing me off as I was going through it because I remembered seeing answers that I marked correct where one of the centers was R and the other was S. And for this structure, I was getting them both S, but it also seemed correct. So, um, yeah, obviously, if you swap two groups, which we've swapped the methyl and the hydrogen from this structure to get this one, if you swap two groups, you always get the opposite configuration. So it would definitely make sense that this one would be R and that this one would be S. Sorry about that confusion. Any other questions? Okay, y'all. Some of you I will see this evening.